Welking. I'm a program associate here at Children and Family Futures based out of Irvine, California. I want to thank you for joining us. I would like to acknowledge that we did receive many questions from you submitted during the registration process. We will try to incorporate these questions into our presentation. Now I'd like to introduce you to Phil Breitenbusher, Program Director for Children and Family Futures for some preliminary and program remarks. Okay, thanks a lot, Alexis. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been a growing interest in looking at family drug court models across the country. And, and we're going to talk about two, two of the models, realizing there's really a variation and um, a continuum, really, of these two models of parallel and integrated. And we'll talk more about what each of those are as we define those and have some discussion. Uh, before I move on to that, though, I'd like to introduce to you our esteemed presenters today. Um, speaking to us from Denver, Colorado, we have the Honorable Karen Ashby. Uh, Judge Ashby was appointed to the Denver Juvenile uh, Court Bench in September 1998. Prior to her appointment, Judge Ashby practiced in Denver Trial Office of the Colorado State Public Defender for five years and was in private practice specializing in criminal trials, appeals, and family law. She hears all types of juvenile cases and presently serves as the presiding judge of the Denver Juvenile Court. She has pioneered the Family Integrated Drug Court where she charges, where charges against parents uh, with both drug and neglect violations are heard jointly. Judge Ashby's goal is to make Denver's Juvenile Court a model for the nation. Judge Ashby graduated from Williams College in Massachusetts and received her law degree from the University of Denver Law School in 1983. Thanks for joining us, Judge Ashby. Also, you'll hear from the Honorable Karen Adam from Pima County, Arizona. Uh, judge Adam has been on the bench since 1981 and was appointed as a Superior Court Judge in September 2010. She has served as a City Court Magistrate and as a Commissioner on the Juvenile, Probate, and Family Law Benches. She is currently the Presiding Judge in Pima County Juvenile Court. Judge Adam is a member of the Self-Represented Litigants Network, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and the National and Arizona Chapters of the Association of Family and Consulate Conciliation Courts. She is the Dean of the Judicial College of Arizona, a member of the NCJFCJ Curriculum Committee, and has served on, as faculty for the National Judicial College since 2007. She is a frequent lecturer on juvenile and family topics, including self-represented litigation issues. So we welcome both of our presenters, and we thank you for joining us. All right. So, what I wanted to do today, just quickly reminding all of you, some of you are first-time participants in the Family Drug Court Learning Academy, and others of you have attended several of these webinars. But as we talk today about the Family Drug Court models, I wanted to remind you that some of our discussion, uh, if, as you're thinking through um, some of these challenges or uh, some of these potential um, opportunities for your court, you might want to revisit some of the earlier webinars. For instance, um, when you're thinking about uh, your model, you might want to go back and think about your mission and underlying values. You, and we have that webinar posted on our website, and you can listen to that. It also relates, of course, to the uh, principles of collaborative practice. Um, you'll also hear how it, how it ties into information sharing and data systems. Um, and so you see our other uh, webinars. All of these webinars are posted to our website. You can go and download those and, and replay them um, back. Uh, this year we focus on an advanced practice. And uh, you see the webinars that we've already held this year. Um, we have one more next month that will be focused on sustainability. I'll talk about how you can register for that one um, at the end of this presentation. But I think that this particular presentation directly ties in also to judicial leadership and ethics. And so um, if you have more, if you like more information and you didn't, weren't able to participate on that webinar, you can go to our website and that's now available uh, to listen back to. So uh, before we get started on the presentation, let's start with our first polling question. So uh, we're going to go ahead and launch this now. We would like to know from you, how are you viewing today's webinar presentation? Uh, are you viewing it by yourself, uh, with another colleague, um, with two or with three? So go ahead, if you would, please respond to that polling question. We'll give you a few moments to respond, and then we'll go ahead and close up the poll. All right, I see most of you have responded, so we'll go ahead and close it up. And it looks like uh, the large majority of, of you are viewing this by yourself, and a few of you are viewing it with one other colleague. So thanks for responding to that. 
All right. So as we begin to talk about the two models that uh, we'll mainly be discussing today, parallel and integrated, I wanted to just kind of bring us back to our origins here. Um, many of our presentations start like this, that, um, with the beginnings, I guess you would say, um, back in the late 90s. Um, drug courts, the family drug courts, uh, started across the country. And um, in those early days, 90, you know, late 90s through 2005, as we kind of jumped um, in the implementation of family drug courts, there was hardly any literature out there on, on even what these models were. In 2004, there was a publication, a monograph, and began to talk about the ingredients or kind of did some initial definition that uh, Dr. Nancy Young had, had written um, with, with other colleagues on the two models, and that was later published um, by BJA, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, by CSAT, uh, the Center for Substance Use Treatment, later published that monograph and, and did some early definitions um, when we were looking at the early five kind of family drug courts. And, and um, since then, there's been a proliferation, and there's a continuum of those different types of models across the country. We now know there's over 350 family drug courts, and and we know that there's a, a large range in the way that these family drug courts are implemented uh, based on regional resources, uh, regional laws, um, based on um, the whether you're urban or whether you're rural, uh, based on your practices, your culture, um, how your legal system works in your own state or your own community. So there's lots of reasons why you've, you've implemented the model, or if you're thinking about implementing a family drug court, these kind of things will come into play. And we'll talk more about that, and you'll hear from the judges on, on how these kind of items played into their decisions in choosing their model. We took a quick look at the 58 or so family drug court sites that we're working with across the country, and, and it, it looked like it was a pretty close split. And so I don't think there's any definitive number or percentage of of the 350 approximate family drug courts, how many of those are integrated versus parallel. But from our numbers, it, it appears that about 60% of the ones that we're working with are integrated and 40% are parallel. And I think we're working with about five right now that are in the midst of switching from one of those models. So um, it seems like it's, it's pretty much in the middle of, of these two models. And again, um, there's lots of hybrids, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and you get an idea of those hybrids and continuum when you look at this slide. So you see on the left-hand side of your screen what we talk about integrated. I'll go into more definition, but essentially the dependency matters, recovery, are all in the same court with the same judicial officer. Um, and then the over, I'll skip over dual track for a moment and talk about parallel. And in the parallel model, the dependency matters are separate from the recovery matters. And there's two judges, and it's held in a parallel or separate court. Um, dual track um, are essentially that they are in a um, again the same the same court, um, but that they may be start in in a larger court. San Diego is kind of the model of the dual track, if you will. They, everyone starts together, and then if there's a problem, then they may go to a, an elevated court where they're seen more often by a specialized judicial officer. Um, who will really focus on those drug court uh, recovery management issues. And then there's kind of the opposite but uh, version of that, which we call home court intensive, which is essentially um, you're in an integrated type of model, but if there's problems with your dependency case, then it might revert back to another court or a, um, another judge who hears kind of those contested issues. Um, they might hear um, a TPR, those types of things. So again, this is a continuum, and a lot of courts kind of work in between the lines with these different types of models. Um, but based on those kind of brief definitions, we'd like to open up our next polling question and ask you, what type of family drug court model are you currently implementing or using in your jurisdiction? And there's the options there. So we'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and respond to that, and, uh, or a few seconds, I should say. So uh, very similar to the numbers that we're seeing with the sites that we're working with um, in that split between integrated and parallel. Um, just a few more of you are operating integrated versus the parallel. But, but again, you see that dual track and then the uncertainty. About a third of you, um, or a little over a quarter of you, are uncertain, meaning that maybe one of these definitions, as I described them, you weren't quite sure where you fit in all of that. And um, that's pretty common, as I said, with the continuum. So, 
Uh, maybe as the discussion goes on, um, you'll figure out or um, they'll maybe, maybe have your own name for what you call your court. All right. So um, real quickly here, I kind of talked um, through this already, but when we talk about an integrated court, um, I'll use the term dependency case. And what I mean by that is your, your standard kind of juvenile case, from protective custody or your uh, detention hearing all the way through permanency. And then when we're talking about recovery management or recovery aspect of the case, what we're talking about is from the time the referral's made from, to screening and assessment or drug court sessions, get, uh, monitoring the treatment, all of those kind of things, all the way through drug, uh, graduation. So um, I'm kinda, we're going to kind of use those terms. I don't want you to be familiar with that. The, the dependency or integrated model, I'm sorry, um, is essentially that those are all on one track. Dependency matters, recovery management is in the same court with the same judge. Pretty straightforward. And, and again, some of the um, strengths that we see oftentimes in this court include that it can be sustainable pretty easily. Uh, once you're up and running, it's seen, it's integrated into your regular court practice in some cases. And so um, you won't risk it being seen as a separate court uh, and therefore can be sustainable in that way. Also, um, at a systems level, it offers the opportunity for the court to use its leverage to hold the systems accountable for, for the variety of services that are provided for the family treatment per, uh, plan. So not only holding the treatment services accountable, but also the children's services. And, and that certainly plays out um, when you're trying to get children uh, transported to different types of parenting programs or counseling programs with the parents. And if the court's not able to um, exercise that leverage, that, that can be one of those barriers that we see in the parallel. Uh, but, but exercising that leverage is, is one of those um, systems strengths in the integrated model. Um, at the case level, a couple of the strengths are the integrated case plan. I mean, naturally, because this case, the recovery management and the dependency matters are all integrated, it's much easier to have an integrated case plan um, across the various systems. Um, also, how we track the data can be easier, too, because, again, it's integrated into, hopefully, one data set, um, and it's not outside the court system. Some of the challenges that we see sometimes with integrated are the perceived ex parte communications and um, some challenges um, ethically for judicial officers. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, and sometimes this requires uh, the uh, judicial officers to recuse themselves uh, during certain parts of the dependency matters. Um, at the case or at the systems level, um, there's sometimes this challenge of balancing the time or the clocks between recovery and the dependency matters or the, the statutory hearings and timelines. Um, that, can, that can happen right off the bat in an integrated court that you can't really begin servicing this parent until you finish disposition or at least have adjudication or, or take jurisdiction of, of that client. So sometimes in integrated court, we see that they actually start later on than we can see in a parallel court, or uh, the parents aren't able to get into treatment as quickly in integrated court. Uh, that's one of the challenges sometimes we see. Um, another, of course, is on the resources of the social workers and attorneys, the child welfare social workers, and having to be at the uh, every single weekly hearing and every single staffing uh, that can sometimes be a drain on resources, and um, sometimes you don't have that um, burden on the resources in the parallel model. So uh, we'll talk more about that. Let's, let's switch over to parallel uh, model real quick. Again, the dependency matters and the recovery management is happening just the same in both of these models. But in this case, um, dependency matters and dependency judge stay in one court, and those happen at, during the regularly scheduled statutory guidelines or timelines, and then in a whole other court on another track, if you will, uh, if you look at the bottom there, the, the recovery management uh, drug court sessions are happening with a different judge. So I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the parallel model also offers some strengths at the case level, um, and one that early on was of great significance especially was the opportunity to really focus on the parent's recovery and to ensure access to treatment for that parent um, and to really develop and leverage the court's resources um, to kind of convene the treatment uh, providers uh, and to get that access. So that's, that's one. It really focuses on the parent's recovery. 
Um, confidentiality of the children can be maintained in the open court process. So using the kind of traditional drug court model where all the parents participate together, um, we're in the parallel model, sometimes you're not talking about children as much or specifically, so confidentiality is maintained. Um, and there's sometimes not the perceived problems of the ex party discussions in the parallel model. At the systems level, um, we've seen that some of the parallel courts can serve uh, much larger numbers. Um, and uh, we also have that kind of critical consciousness parents are able to hear from others because that open court happens, that open court process. Um, at the case level, um, sometimes we can see some challenges being that the social workers also need to have, they're, they're going to two different courts. If, if social workers are needed to come to the parallel court, um, not all the time that they need to, but when they do, um, they feel like they're stretched between two different courts. Um, sometimes responding to participant behavior, meaning issuing sanctions on a parent and not knowing where the children are at or what the process of, of the parent is in that dependency matter, that can be a challenge in making sure that information is happening or information sharing across the two courts is happening. Um, some challenges with the parallel court of the case or the systems level, I should say, is that sometimes you have two different case plans and being sure that you're not duplicating those uh, service plans or even uh, resources across the two programs can be, can be an issue. Um, Sustainability sometimes is a challenge in the parallel court, and more, and we're hearing about that more as, as the budget gets tighter. And that if the parallel court is seen as a set aside court or a boutique court in which uh, the drug court isn't kind of integrated into a larger system, then when people are looking at resources and they're looking at the, that separate court as a drain on it, that may be tougher to make the case to sustain that program uh, in, instead of it just being integrated into your daily practice. Um, Another one I want to point out here is the accountability on the child welfare. So sometimes in the parallel court, because the focus becomes so much on the parent, um, that social workers don't attend um, the case, the, 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 the family drug court uh, sessions, and sometimes there's no um, attorneys even present. And so the accountability for the child welfare system in, and their investment into the family drug court is sometimes diminished a little bit in the, in the parallel court, and that's something that has to be worked on. Uh, to maintain this, this model. So um, I think our message here as we get started in this discussion, it's not necessarily about the structure or the model. Um, as much as we want to give you a silver bullet in your communities and say, here's the model, here is, this is the perfect way to do it, it's not, it's not so much about that in our experience. It's really about the collaborative process and the mutual accountability. And the question I think we, you should be asking yourself and as we have this discussion with our two uh, judges today is thinking about does your structure help you achieve uh, better treatment for your parents? Does it help you to get more uh, quicker access to treatment for, for parents? Are services being improved for children? Um, are you having, uh, are there any troubles with sharing information? Does the structure get in the way of sharing information or does it help you? Um, does it get in the way of having shared accountability or mutual accountability or does it get in the way? If the structure isn't helping and it's getting in the way, then that may need to be looked at. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, how, how you might go about looking at, at your own court and, and thinking about really, I think these four bullets in a nutshell kind of pull it together and, and, and thinking about does, are you having any problems with any of these areas um, and is the structure a pro, uh, one of the challenges with that? So, all right, let's uh, go to our next polling question. Is your family drug court currently exploring implementing a different model? Uh, yes, no, possibly, not sure, or uncertain. Half of you approximately say no, um, and another, just about half, are either possibly or yes. And then 14% uh, said not sure if you're thinking about implementing a different model. So uh, hopefully some of this discussion then will be helpful for, for many of you. And if you're not looking at implementing a different model, um, but you're interested in different models uh, because you're attending today, then maybe this will just help you kind of make sure that the model you are implementing is really working best for you in your jurisdiction. So with that, um, I'd like you to start this discussion. Um, what we're going to talk about next is I'm going to 
uh, turn it over to uh, Judge Adam and then Judge Ashby. And I'd like for, for you ladies to talk about um, how just a little bit of background on the, on the program that you're implementing. Give us a background on your program, and then I'd like you to talk to us about how you selected the model for your jurisdiction. And so with that, I'm happy to now introduce to you and turn it over to the Honorable Karen Adam. Great. Judge? Thank you, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I don't think we're in good evening, but wherever you are and whatever you're doing, we're delighted to have you here. And I'm happy to speak on this. When Phil was doing my introduction, I um, neglected to include that I actually was, until a month ago, the presiding family law judge, uh, family court judge, and um, drug court judge here, and just stepped down on September 1st. And I'm sure that if you were paying attention to the bio, um, you were wondering why in the heck am I on this program. But I did preside for five years. I am the presiding judge, so even though I'm retired from uh, doing drug court, I'm in a position to really make sure to the extent that I'm able that the court, the administration supports drug court, uh, supports expanding drug court to the extent that we are able. And I can tell you that one thing we were successful at recently was getting a new job position for our drug court coordinator, changing her to a management level position, and then getting a supervisor. So being the presiding judge has advantages, even though I'm not directly in the courtroom every day with drug court. I am still sneaking in and doing the graduations for those clients I handled for many, many months. I thought I would just tell you a little bit about Pima County, and you could go to the next slide which has a lot of the data. So those are kind of the dry numbers about who we are. Um, I did make sure that they moved the blue dot on that first map down to Tucson from Phoenix, because any of you that are in uh, the not biggest city in a state know that you always have to go to that biggest city for all of your training, and that's always the model. Interestingly, Tucson has been a, uh, a little pocket of uh, collaboration and creative work and the Pima County Juvenile Court has long been a model of, of lots of best practices really for the past 40 years. We are um, in the community with the University of Arizona for many, many, many years. There was a sociologist at the U of A who loved our ready-made um, database and there's been lots of great work that's come out of Pima County Juvenile Court around delinquency as well as around child welfare. We're a big city, a million, but a small town feel. We have a lot of poverty. We have a lot of untethered, disconnected families. People move out here. It's the Sun Belt. They have no safety net. They spend their savings within a short period of time. There's not a lot of um, high-level employment. In that regard, Phoenix really does have the edge over us, lots of corporate headquarters, executive and management positions, and so forth. We're largely a service-related uh, industry town. We have more call centers than most places. So we're dealing with people who, if they are here and if they are able to be employed, they are likely earning minimum wage or less. When the economy tanked, um, we had serious problems here, and we believe we're seeing the end of that very long spiral. We are one of five states where there has been an increase in the number of children in foster care, or almost 11,000 children in foster care statewide, which is just a stunning number. We have 3,600 children in open dependency cases and about 3,000 of them in um, out-of-home placements. These new petitions that we're getting are alleging serious abuse and neglect we had a record number in August. We're way down in September and hope that things have abated. At the same time, there was a crisis with CPS. In Arizona, the Child Protective Services Child Welfare is a statewide organization. And so we are dealing with statewide policies and procedures. And because it's a state agency, the Attorney General appears as the lawyer for Child Protective Services in all cases. Again, they are statewide. They get their directions from Phoenix. 
sometimes that does not work well for us. In other instances, we have been able to very effectively change policy around the state uh, by virtue of the work that we've done here that has been tried and true. So for example, in our dependency petitions now, the Attorney General alleges, along with the child abuse and neglect language, that we will be resolving custody, parenting time, child support, and paternity. That gives us the leverage to do some collaborative work to um, consolidate cases and to really send people out with a fully enforceable order that covers all of the issues that uh, families have when they come in. Um, we've been a model court since 1996. The model court is a project uh, run by the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges in line with the resource guidelines, which are based on federal law around best practices in managing child welfare cases. We started in 1996 with a collaboration we have a, an unabated um, collaboration. We have met monthly since 1996 on the child welfare side. In 2004, we became a delinquency model court, same, same type of program, also administered by the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. We have a ready-made set of stakeholders who have assisted us with every initiative, every change, every uh, best practice that we have been able to institute in the court really since the mid-90s. And that, I think, is a really important point about drug court, is the collaboration and having your stakeholders and partners or system partners, whatever you want to call them, engaged and committed. Because we have been a model court, because our bench is used to seeing these proposals, these goals, these projects every year um, in an effort to do our business better, they are very committed to drug court. And why, you might ask, that's because family drug court actually was a model court goal here in 2001. So when you have a model court, one of the requirements is that you come up with goals every year. Uh, you try to be modest with them. And as we had been uh, working on our best practices, by 2001, we had a lot of the procedures and protocols for handling standard dependency child welfare cases down pat, I'd say. I mean, we weren't perfect. But we had already worked very, very hard, meeting twice a month, subcommittees, separate work, developing protocols, and literally getting the state rules of juvenile procedure and statutes changed to be in line with the resource guidelines. So by the time we got to 2001 and early in 2000, up to about 2005, we were able to look at more nuanced programming things that would be more specific to the issues that our families uh, brought us. So one of our uh, stakeholders suggested uh, drug court, family drug court. We were actually already doing a juvenile drug court, so we kind of had the drug court mindset here. The adult system had recently begun an adult drug court. It was kind of beginning to be the way the court in Pima County, which is Tucson, does business. We got a SAMHSA grant to plan and implement a family drug court, did site visits in Reno, San Diego, Miami, Florida, and Prescott, Arizona. Prescott had been doing a family drug court for some time, just kind of no extra money, just working it in. A fabulously innovative judge, Bob Brutonell, who is now, lucky for all of us, on the Supreme Court. Uh, parenthetically, it's wonderful to have a Supreme Court justice who has been a juvenile court judge. When we did those site visits, it was an interesting group. The presiding judge, the assistant and assistant attorney general, representatives from our contract lawyer list um, did, uh, who represent both parents and children, the researcher from Arizona State University, who was at that point the person who was doing our data collection, 
a representative from CPS, and a representative from our court dependency unit. They all went on these visits. They chose San Diego as the model because San Diego's demographics are very similar to ours in terms of racial and ethnic um, uh, percentages. San Diego had a parallel model. It was a voluntary program. We piloted it in one zip code, one of the zip codes from which many, many, many largest percentage of our cases came. Our first client joined in June 2001. We had our first graduate in September 2002. We added two more CPS units in 2002. And in 2004, we took it courtwide and statewide. The only units who are not eligible just at the outset are the sex abuse units and the Pima County um, town of Ajo, which is 120 miles away. We're a huge county in terms of um, square miles, and it was just absolutely unworkable to have that uh, county involved. You've got a slide that is showing some of the data about the court. And I, I'll just talk to you a little bit about why the parallel model was chosen. And then as this presentation goes on, we can talk in more detail. I actually I was not around when, when um, this drug court was developed. I was down in Superior Court doing family law and probate and covering in the adult drug court. When I came to juvenile court, in two, came back to juvenile court in 2007, I was recruited to be the judge doing the family drug court model, largely because I had the experience of adult drug court, and they were looking for um, some changes. And one good way to change things up is to change the judge. That I did contact the former presiding judge who was involved in the decision about why we chose the parallel model. And what I learned was that they, they had the lawyers involved. And they, they went on all these site visits. And then they spent a lot of time meeting and discussing and I think arguing over what uh, model would ultimately work best in Tucson. Because we already had the stakeholders and because we already had the collaboration, that was not an issue. Everybody was committed. We knew we were going to do a drug court. Everyone was on board, behavioral health, CPS, the attorneys, and so forth. One thing we looked at in, term, in terms of, practical, of the practical responses was the time involved for the lawyers, the caseworkers, and the attorney general to attend weekly hearings. Our model is that for the first level, which can be completed in eight weeks, you come every week. Um, we also heard from our attorneys. And I think this is a really, really interesting point. They would not buy into a model where weekly or monthly hearings could so dramatically impact the long-term progress of the dependency or termination case. We all know, doing this work, that from week to week, people are up and down. There will be a relapse or a lapse or a missed call or a missed drop. The regular dependency cases are heard every three months by the dependency judge who's assigned. One of the questions that was submitted was how many judges are involved. And in our model, it's the drug court judge and the assigned dependency judge period. There are two of us. So when you have review hearings every three months or every four months, there is time for uh, people to bounce back for there to be 20 clean drops after one dirty drop or a missed drop or a missed call. But when you're doing things on a weekly basis, they could be blown out of proportion. So I thought that was a very, very interesting um, insight from the lawyers. And they said we would much rather deal with our clients on a more, well, with a more um, uh, coherent and full and um, fully informed set of data over a three-month period, then maybe somebody had a bad day and missed treatment or missed an AA meeting or whatever it was. Even then, in 1999, there were ethics concerns. And you know the code of ethics has changed uh, twice since then. And um, there were concerns especially about ex parte communications if all of these folks, especially the lawyers and the other parties, didn't come to every drug court session. 
They didn't, on the other hand, want to require all those people to come um, if they didn't have a substance abuse issue, if they were working and supporting the family, or if they were eligible, had a substance abuse issue, and weren't choosing drug court. Um, they didn't want to uh, require people to come for reasons that had to do with efficiency and time management, but also how that would impact on the people um, currently in drug court. They also believed that championing and supporting the family drug court in a, the family drug court client in a non-neutral way would be difficult to do when everyone else is present. And I know I teach about self-represented litigants, and one of the things that I teach judges is always to make sure that if you say something nice to one person, you say something nice to the other, that you, you know, obviously you're making eye contact with everyone, you don't give one party a Kleenex box without the other, but one of the really important parts of drug court is the individualized care and attention that is given to really some very, very fragile clients. Now that we know what we know about trauma, and now that we have the trauma piece integrated so completely into our programming and services, we just really believe that the dynamics change if you have everybody else in the room. In fact, we do gender-specific programming, so we don't even, in drug court, have the both sides of a case in the same session. We have women only and men only for a lot of reasons. Even if people start out together, they can end up splitting. Sometimes with sobriety comes a realization that you may not have picked the perfect life partner. Um, and um, there's often domestic violence, sometimes just on its own, sometimes related to the substance abuse. So the decision was made that separating those folks um, is really in um, the best interest of the client, in the best interest of the other client and allows the judge in the dependency action to look at all of the issues, not just the issues related to um, the one who is uh, dealing with recovery, hopefully in an effective way. So um, I think I'm going to leave my other comments for um, the discussion about how we serve our clients and how we best uh, address participant needs. And I'll turn this over to my colleague and friend, Karen Ashby, we were both on the Board of Trustees of the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges at the same time. There are a lot of similarities in our backgrounds we discovered, and I'm always delighted to be able to spend time with her. We're both off the board, so we relish these opportunities to work together. And even though we're doing different models, I respect her and I respect her judgment. She does amazing work in Denver. Judge Ashby. Well, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Um, so let me just give a little background so that you have the context in which we decided what model we were implementing and, and why we did what we did. So Denver Juvenile Court is the only uh, separate juvenile court in the state of Colorado. It is a district court level court, however, in every other judicial district in the state. It is part of their district court and judges rotate through juvenile as they do um, other district court case types. Denver Juvenile Court, we are appointed to the court and we do not rotate. So we handle DNNs, dependency and neglect, paternity and support, delinquency, truancy, adoption and relinquishment, and other case types involving minors. And what um, I noticed when I came on the court, and I've been here since 1998 and the presiding judge since 1999, was over time, as many of you I'm sure have experienced, many of our families coming into the dependency and neglect case type docket had significant substance abuse problems. We also realized that there were a number of our families who had dependency and neglect cases where one or both of the parents also had pending um, criminal cases, and many of them were on district court probation. Many of them were, in fact, in district court, drug court here in Denver, which, again, was in a separate court. And what we were finding was that there was not good coordination between the two courts. Um, oftentimes there would be common terms and conditions of probation with treatment plan objectives on the dependency case, 
but the different courts weren't communicating effectively and probation and human services weren't communicating effectively. And since these were families that were really high level, high need, high risk families, we wanted to do better by them because our outcomes we were finding were not good with this um, group of families. And so our court has three judges and 1.75 um, magistrates and who are handling all of our dockets. And so when we looked at what model we were going to um, implement, we had to look at what our court structure was, what the, our partners' um, availability and abilities were and resources to staff any model that we uh, developed. And we, like Tucson, um, have been a model court. And so we have that collaborative structure in place. And I think that also is a consideration when you are looking at what model you're going to implement is not only that collaborative um, nature of your court and how collaborative it has been, um, but also what is the culture of your legal and child welfare community within your jurisdiction. Do you have respondent parents, counsel, and guardian ad litems, for instance, who are, are very collaborative or are they very litigious? Um, and in our experience, we had actually a very collaborative structure and respondent parents, counsel, guardians, city attorneys, and the court all had a very good relationship and the department as well. So in looking at um, the various issues such as that culture, also what financial and other support we may have, not only internally here in our court, but also from the state court administrator's office, from the Department of Human Services, what community partnerships we had, what if any legislative support there was uh, regarding family treatment courts. We had to take that into account. We started our model where we were grant funded for the first three years, and that included some judicial staff. So we were actually able to fund a judicial officer for a period of time who oversaw the court. Ultimately, the funding went away for the judicial staff, um, and the commitment from our court was that we wanted to continue to have family uh, integrated drug court, um, but we were not going to be able to support either probation officers um, or judicial staff uh, with additional funding. We do still have grants that support services, and that is ultimately um, where a lot of the financial support comes from. In looking at our model, we also looked at what was our child welfare population? How many cases did we have? How many cases were we trying to ultimately impact? And could we reasonably serve given our court structure, et cetera? And we wanted to ensure that we were improving the service delivery to the families and the case coordination and case management of, for these families. Um, some of the issues that were coming up, for instance, had to do with parents who were in adult drug court, uh, and we would have an open DNN, and they would go before the drug court judge, and they would have a miss UA, or they would have a positive UA for alcohol. And on the DNN side, we may have been looking at the progress that the parent was making and wanting to return the child home or change the nature of visits with the uh, children. And when we were doing that, we'd then find out, well, they just were sent to a weekend jail up in drug court. And so we, again, we weren't well coordinated. We also wanted to have better informed decision making by the judicial officer who was handling the uh, dependency case, as well as be informed regarding what was going on in the criminal case and be able to, to facilitate that, that case management, resource sharing, um, and those kinds of things. And when we looked at where we had been as a model court, um, though National Council hasn't come out in the context of family treatment courts and said whether they believe the one family, one judge model should be something that's implemented, for us, that was, a, that was embedded in how we handled cases. All of the cases for a family in our court are assigned to the same judicial officer. 
um, delinquency, and other case types. So we already had that foundation of um, really implementing the one family, one judge, and it seemed like a natural fit. So looking at all of those considerations, we then ultimately set our program up so it was an integrated model. And I was appointed by our Chief Justice as a district court judge to handle the family integrated drug court docket. And we, the eligibility criteria for the program include having an open dependency and neglect case as well as a criminal case for which the parent who is in the integrated drug court program is on probation. We have designated probation officers. We have designated social workers in the program, the city attorney, uh, a mental health professional from the Kemp Center, which is located here in Denver. Um, they participate because they are a very child-focused um, mental health agency, but they also can assist with the adults. Uh, we have respondent parents, counsel, guardian, ad items, and then the DA and the PD or a public defender are on the team, but they only appear when there's a revocation pending on the criminal case. I don't staff who comes into the program. That's a staffing process that takes place separately. And once a parent comes in, it is a voluntary program, but I then decide if they leave um, and when. And we do have a staffing process before each um, docket. We only are able to accommodate, because of the way this is structured, a limited number of families. So that is one of the downsides. We have a maximum of 20 to 25 families currently, though we're looking at trying to expand that. We also have a biweekly review. Uh, we have a phase structure, and ultimately, when we're looking at graduation from the program, we have graduation, but we also have successful terminations, which are somewhat different uh, than graduations. And I handle the termination hearing for those cases that are in integrated drug court um, for those cases that were originally assigned to my division. So um, I do see the case from beginning to end and uh, we ultimately have been able to manage those ethical issues, which I think we'll talk about um, more in a bit. But looking at all those considerations, really because we were trying to do better joint case management and coordination and informed decision making by the judicial officer, it ultimately meant that the integrated drug court model was going to be a better fit for us than a parallel model. So that was kind of my answer to the initial question, Phil. I don't know if there's follow-up you would like. No, thank you. Um, I guess just as we kind of start this conversation, um, Judge Adam, was there anything else you wanted to add in regards to uh, type or model selection? No, that's fine. Thanks, Phil. Okay. All right. So. Let's go ahead and move to the next discussion item here. And, and in thinking about your individual models, um, and I'll start this time with Judge Ashby, um, and I think you, you've started to talk about this, but, but in what ways, how do you think that the model that you've chosen for your jurisdiction best serves um, your participants, so the participants in the family drug court? And when you're thinking about some of these items here in case planning, your interaction with the client, children, um, you talked about responding to participant behavior and, and the challenge that was happening, I think, before you selected this model. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how you feel that this model best serves your participants? Sure. And, and for me, I think um, I've presided over the Family Integrated Drug Court docket since it started. I was involved in developing the model um, back in 2002. So um, when I was ultimately thinking about what made sense, one of the things that I still believe and believed then was that when we're looking at sobriety, sobriety is so integrated into every, or lack thereof, is integrated into every aspect of a person's life, but their social, their family, their individual um, circumstances, and sobriety and recovery don't occur in isolation. As, as people are 
becoming sober and learning how to live their life soberly. Um, we have to address all those other issues in their life and m ensure that their recovery process is well integrated into all of those other aspects of their life, including their parenting. And we've also found that having the other parent involved in the process, one, we can support the other parent. Um, in understanding what their role may be with respect to um, the mother or their father's recovery and how it impacts the children and how they can support the children. We can also look at what are the issues related to the children and the parents' recovery and coordinate those efforts along with the recovery for that parent. Um, having authority over the other parent through the DNN case and having it um, integrated into the family treatment court docket gives us the ability to address issues with respect to that other client through their treatment plan or court orders that may be negatively impacting uh, how a parent is recovering. Uh, we also have found that we're better able to leverage the resources that we have on the probation side uh, with the human services dollars. So we have offender services dollars, for instance, that um, support many of the services for the probation clients. We have been able to really work well together in making sure that sometimes we're areas where the Department of Human Services may have less resources to support a particular program or service for a client, we're able to look to probation and they can fill that gap and vice versa. Um, We've also been able to um, look at the, how we assess issues of child safety relative to the recovery and to respond to those as necessary very quickly. We don't have to have that mechanism whereby we're trying to translate all that information over to the dependency court, but we're able to do that on an ongoing basis. Um, so I think those have been some of the real positives for how the model has worked in serving the population that we identified. Great. And uh, Judge Adam, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. First of all, um, we are a one family, one judge model as well. And so this does run a bit counter to what we believe in our core is the right way to um, handle cases. So it had to be there had to be compelling reasons for us to do it a different way. And um, I can tell you that I have my own caseload of dependency cases. And as Judge Ashby, we do all the other kinds of uh, work around children and families here as well. Um, I have my own um, set of cases of clients who we're talking now about 80% of, of our dependency cases involve one or the other or both parents and substance abuse of some sort. And I, I um, always wish that they were doing drug court because I know the, the problems with a regular schedule of three to four month reviews and jumping on issues. So I completely understand Judge Ashby's um, appreciation for being able to handle the issues that we see in drug court in a quicker way because I get frustrated with my regular cases and um, having to wait that period of time. That said, um, one of the... Ad I think the biggest advantage in terms of um, client services is the fact that we are doing individualized um, case management. That we, are, we have staffings and we're able to talk very candidly in those staffings just as we're able to speak very candidly in court and I think it is this open communication that is one of the big pluses of a parallel model. At our staffings we have our drug court team, we have representatives from treatment we have our trauma therapist. In Arizona, all behavioral health services come through Title 19 from federal dollars, uh, directed out through regional behavioral health authorities who contract with providers. So neither CPS nor the court is providing services. And one of our big limitations is that we are stuck with, and I mean that literally in some cases, the services that a parent qualifies for by virtue of which network they're enrolled in. And then because it's Arizona and because um, we're broke, uh, so many parents have lost their ability to access services. So 
so many, many, many of our parents um, don't have any treatment at all, have lost their uh, psychotropic meds and so forth. So it's a huge challenge. That's kind of across the system. One of the advantages of the drug court model, the parallel model, is that we are uh, so specialized and we have all of these folks at the table and we have been able to learn about opportunities for medication, opportunities for treatment, that the regular CPS worker, the regular judge, the regular attorney general in one of the other thousand cases that we've got going uh, just isn't going to know about or be able to keep track of. I'm hoping that gradually we're able to, as, as Phil said, the new word is instead of going to scale, we're trying to infuse drug court theory and principle and practice across the bench. But because we have all those folks present in that staffing, and then they're also in the courtroom generally, um, we can really get at the nitty gritty and the clients are very comfortable speaking openly with us in court. And we, I have to tell you, that increased dramatically when we started doing gender specific sessions and not having the partners um, in the same session, especially because so many of these cases involve high conflict or domestic violence or both. Um, and we do have services for the other parents, though. So even if, uh, even though we made a decision that the um, non-using parent, the working parent, the parent who just chose not to be in recovery, uh, met, might not have been willing to come to a drug court session uh, at the frequency we designed, we do offer um, the Celebrating Families program to our folks who are in our second level and they are allowed to have um, bring the other parent, whether they're in a couple still or not, and the children. So that is a direct service for the children, and it is the service that Judge Ashby was talking about, which is kids getting to learn that it's not their fault, they didn't cause it, and children learning how to relate to parents who are now sober. You know, they've never sat down to dinner together. They've never had a parent who read to them, imposed a curfew, whatever. So um, we're, we are getting the rest of the family involved at that level, just not in the hearings where we are um, managing what is the case plan. We don't have a separate case plan. We go off the CPS case plan trying to keep this as unburdensome for everyone as possible and not have competing case plans. Um, so we talk about treatment issues, what the problems are, what's happening generally in the dependency case, and um, reviewing and looking at sanctions. Um, so I would say that it's the openness, the ability to do the individualized treatment, and the ability for there to be a very, very special connection between the judge and the drug court client, which it's so interesting. Everybody tries everything around sanctions and um, and uh, uh, rewards or or um, whatever you want to call it, and that relationship between the client and the judge remains a really important part of all drug court success. I just think it's so interesting, and it is easier to do, I think, when you are dealing only with the person who's um, working the drug court program. That's all I'd have to say on that. Yeah. Uh, Judge Ashby, anything to add? Um, I would just say that I, I understand um, the concern uh, regarding the relationship that a judicial officer may form with the client who is the active participant in the drug court program. Um, we actually have our docket set up so that I see only the individual who is on probation. Sometimes we have couples who are on probation, but I see the CR case on the regular review docket every week or every other week as they move through the program. And then the DNN case I set for review on a regular three to four month schedule and bring it back more frequently as necessary to address issues that are DNN only. So I have that person in front of me on a regular basis and we don't address DNN issues at the CR review if there is something that comes up as a result of our having that review which implicates the DNN case then we will notify the other parties and set the matter for hearing as necessary. 
I, the, the relationship that you form with the um, participant family drug court, I think, is a strong relationship. But I also think from doing the regular DNN docket that, and, and having the one family, one judge, um, those, those concerns are something that the judicial officer has to be attentive to, and we have to be aware if we feel as though we've developed feelings as a result of that relationship, which may impact whether we can fairly um, judge the case as a whole and the non-drug court participant as well. Um, but I, I don't think that um, I feel hampered in doing that by having the integrated drug court model. It's just something that I have to do as a judge in other cases as well, which is really be attentive to can I decide this case fairly on the basis of um, the legal and factual evidentiary um, bases that I'm allowed to, or is this relationship or knowledge that I have through other sources going to impact me? But I think that's something that we have to do every day anyway. Great. You know, before we leave this section, I just wanted to, um, there was a question that came in that I wanted to throw to both of you, which is the relationship between graduation and our termination from the Family Drug Court. Um, Judge Ashby, you had said during your opening remarks that, that the parent uh, may not graduate from the Family Drug Court, but they have a successful termination. Um, is that then related to the dependency matter? Um, and how does, and then for Judge Adam, how does the, what's the relationship between Family Drug Court graduation and reunification for you in the parallel court? Uh, maybe Ashby, go ahead and start with that. All right, um, so when I said that we have termination, which may be successful or unsuccessful, and then we also have graduation, graduation encompasses somebody who has maintained their sobriety, um, and at times, uh, most of the time, that means that the children have returned to their care. However, we have had um, parents who have been through the family drug court program who have graduated but there has been an allocation of parental responsibility given, for instance, to a relative. But in, in drafting the allocation of parental responsibility order, we've been able to include a parenting time order for that parent based upon the progress that they have made in family uh, drug court and their sobriety, which they would not have otherwise been able to achieve. So they may not have been able to get every aspect of their life to the point where they or others believe that they can parent a child full time, but they've, they've sufficiently progressed in their sobriety that we still allow them to graduate from the program. We also have successful terminations, um, which may be uh, families who have gone through the program, they um, have not gotten their children back for various reasons because, as we know, sobriety is one of the issues, but there can be so many other issues that impact permanency for a child and what that looks like. Um, and while they may have improved their sobriety, um, they don't have their children back home with them, and they, they may have had some other uh, legal mechanism which, which we've implemented, which um, does not give it does not rise to the level of their graduating from the program because of some other issues that may exist, um, but they still can successfully terminate it from the program. And you have to remember that we have the criminal case and the DNN case also. Most of the time, we are successfully terminating people from probation at the same time that we are terminating them uh, from the dependency and neglect case but for various public safety or other reasons, there may be some remaining time on a probation case um, at the time that we graduate someone from drug court. And Judge Adam, briefly? Yes, uh, our numbers are about 50% uh, graduate of all of them that go through. Some of them have a what we would call a voluntary termination, which is they can't stay in because they have a job or they, um, their case closes early. Sometimes they started drug court late into the case. They did so well that the case underlying case closes. We let them go successfully as long as they are in good standing with us. They're compliant. Um, graduation, about uh, as I said, about 50% graduate. Over 90% of those are reunified with their children. 
And interestingly, 100% of those have had trauma therapy, either the parent, the mother, or the father. A good percentage of those are our drug court fathers who are getting sole custody. That's interesting. We have a good percentage of fathers who were in the program where the mother is not in the program, and the father uh, ultimately achieves custody. Um, the judges are completely current on what's happening in drug court. We don't make any changes to procedures and practices without getting approval from the bench. And every month when we have our regular juvenile bench meetings, I talk about drug court. I'll have the new judge talk about it. And we invite the judges to graduation. Every new judge has to come in and observe a session of the men and a session of the women. And so what's happening in drug court has become a very, very important part of the discussion at ever, every regular dependency review. And so graduation is significant. And graduation is something that the judges take very seriously in deciding what the ultimate permanent plan will be and whether the children will reunify. Wonderful. OK, well, let's, um, thanks for that. Let's, let's switch gears. And we talked about this and introduced this topic earlier um, and the perceived problems with ex parte communications and, uh, and possible uh, the ethical considerations for each model. And, and Judge Adam, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with you on this one um, as you think about the parallel model and potential um, any types of ex parte concerns or how you're dealing with any concerns in your okay. model. Well, as I explained in the beginning, one of our big issues was not putting anyone in the position of having ex parte um, communications when there were other parties to the case who uh, were not present. Since we're running it separately, we don't have the usual concerns about that. Uh, because I'm not the one deciding the dependency issues, so what the parent says to me never gets to the assigned judge. I That having been said, I have to be very, very vigilant about what happens in our court and in terms of ethics and due process. I'm the only lawyer in the room at our staffings and during court. Well, I mean, once in a while, I'll, the parent's lawyer or the child's lawyer will show up for graduation or something like that. But generally, I'm the only one, which means that I need to make sure that the promises that we made regarding due process, regarding disclosure, regarding sharing of information, and regarding not hiding the ball are kept. And, and sometimes I am the least popular person in the room because, you know, a client will have admitted in a session that she relapsed and they, you know, they want to be very good social workers and require them to take responsibility and make the report themselves and they want to give them a long time to do that. And I just feel that we have worked way too long and way too hard to have this program accepted. And we have so much integrity built in and built up that it would be an absolute shame and an outrage to risk that by not having this complete open communication about important issues like relapse, a parent has gone back to an abusive partner, um, we've had recently a parent moved into a new apartment, didn't tell the caseworker, had a visit. I required our case specialist to tell the caseworker. Um, and so it's really, really important. I take that very, very seriously. Um, we, every, the the um, caseworker gets disclosure of everything that happens in drug court except for the initial gain, which is that long, it seems like it's a 100-page long assessment. That's not disclosed. Everything else is disclosed. The worksheet that's prepared for each hearing that lists compliance, that lists concerns, every time a client writes on a sanction, every one of their recovery plans, every one of their the documents that they write for us uh, for each level that they phase to, um, every time they write about um, why they relapsed, all of that is disclosed to the caseworker who discloses it to the lawyers and then the lawyers decide whether to disclose it to the dependency judge. And that's a strategic you know, a decision. We do a minute entry, and um, like a regular hearing, the minute entry goes in the dependency file. So it is as if it's handled seamlessly. There's not a separate file for the drug court. Um, in court, I've 
am scrupulous about not letting the clients go off on long tacks about what's happening in the dependency. And if they do, I uh, refer them to their lawyer. I have uh, referred them to, on the on underlying cases, I've referred them to a self-service center if there's something they need to file. Um, I have given them information about um, how to contact other counsel. Um, but I never, ever say anything about a judge, say anything about a lawyer, and I never, ever say anything about their caseworker, even though sometimes I'm thinking that. Um, also, I always ask the case specialist to please help the clients with these stumbling blocks. So we, as I said, we've got great relationships with our stakeholders. And um, we had a really interesting thing come up where a, uh, a, a, one of our new judges who's, who's very well versed in domestic violence just came down from um, family bench, heard at our staffing that a case manager was pointing her finger and speaking rather loudly to a client at a um, child family team meeting. And he said to us, wow, I sure hope that that woman wasn't a victim of domestic violence. Well, it turns out, of course, she was. And our case specialist was able to just pull her aside, that case manager, and say, you know, um, Betty was um, years in a violent situation. And um, you know, when you were pointing at her at that hearing, at that meeting, you know, it was kind of threatening. And it was all taken very much um, in stride and very well received. And um, so I think that that's um, an example of uh, the good relationship and making sure that information is exchanged both ways. It's very important for me as a judge that I um, am the liaison between the bench and the bar that, and, the, and that everything that we do is open, that we don't change protocols and procedures without getting people to weigh in that a lawyer doesn't find out, oh my gosh, my client just, her rights just got trampled and that's a new procedure and we took something out of the contract and so forth. Um, we talk generally, I will talk generally about, with the judges and the lawyers about open communication, um, and, um, but not about specific cases. So that's how we manage what I think could be a minefield even on a parallel. It's very tempting. Uh, believe me, there have been times when I've wanted to just find the judge and say, you won't believe what's happening in this case. Usually it's more about something that a caseworker hasn't done. You know, some case, uh, a client will say they haven't heard from a caseworker, they haven't done the home visit or whatever, or something that an, the other parent is doing um, that the judge is missing. But I bite my tongue. Great. Judge Ashby? In terms of the ethical issues, I think one of uh, the considerations really in deciding how you structure your program is different judicial officers have a different comfort level with ethical issues and venturing into what some may view as untested um, territory. Uh, I don't tend to have that same reticence. I'm not reckless, but I'm uh, more willing to uh, look at what are the possible ethical considerations here and how am I going to address them, even if I don't have um, a good uh, ethics opinion already on that issue. Um, I think one of the important things regarding ethical issues is to make sure that the team, whether it's parallel or integrated, is well educated in terms of what can be shared with the judicial officers, what can't be shared, when it is appropriate to share, um, when it's necessary to share information not only with the judicial officer but uh, with others. And I think, again, the judicial officer ultimately has to take the lead on ensuring that that education happens and also monitoring that that's happening on an ongoing basis. Um, no matter how we structure programs, issues come up that we're going to have to address. And uh, for instance, when I'm having my criminal case review, uh, it's very common for a parent to mention visitation, that they're not getting visitation, or can we change visitation? I'm doing so well, can't I get unsupervised? Those kinds of things. And I, I tell them when they come into the program what the limits are. And then I also mentioned to them in the hearing, if those kinds of issues come up, 
Well, we will pass all of that information on to your attorney so that they can follow up and make a request on your behalf and share, you know, and, and notice everybody else on any request, or the city attorney will go back and contact all the attorneys, those kinds of things. Um, part of what I realized with our program was because of how collaborative we are, um, sometimes you are perhaps complacent when you shouldn't be regarding being attentive to ethical issues and things such as having written waivers and those kinds of things. We didn't do initially, but over time I recognized that that was something that was important to have. And though in the 10, 11 years that I've been doing this program, I frankly have never had um, a complaint, an ethical complaint, um, regarding how the uh, docket is conducted or my handling certain hearings. In fact, the only issue I've had is one appellate issue where Respondent Parents Council was complaining that I didn't handle a case where I was the most familiar person with the case and they saw that as a problem. Um, but I, I think we have to be very careful not to be um, too complacent and not to get too comfortable because we've worked with people so closely over a number of years that we overlook what some of the ethical considerations are. I think there are more issues that arise with the integrated model um, ethics issues, but I also think that they're very manageable. They're not unlike issues that we have to address in any other case that we're handling. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of being attentive to what those are and making sure that you have processes in place to address them. Great, great. Before uh, we leave this, uh, this section, uh, Judge Adam, just two questions if you wouldn't mind responding to briefly. One sure. question came in asking why the defense attorney isn't present in your courtroom. And the second question, maybe you can just answer both of these together, is um, when you have a client in your family drug court and you have to terminate them from the family drug court, is CPS contacted? How's that information communicated to the uh, dependency court? So um, the presence or absence of attorneys is part of the agreement originally was that the attorneys agreed that um, they would not appear. and. If one of them appeared, they were all going to have to appear, the child's attorney, the attorney general, and the um, defense attorney, parent's attorney. And then if the uh, attorney for the state was there, then they wanted their caseworker to be there. And now in our model, the caseworker does not appear. Um, we do have now a representative from CPS at our staffing, but it's only been in the last few months. We went 10 years and never had CPS at our staffings and we really wanted them because you can solve a lot of problems really quickly when you've got the assistant division director there taking notes. Same with behavioral health. But the, the business of the absence of attorneys is strictly the, um, the parallel model um, and doing things um, completely without counsel and the other parties and the attorneys actually quite delightedly waiving their presence. Um, and that's, again, they trust us, and we're not going to do anything, and I'm not going to do anything that Im will impact negatively um, on the uh, underlying dependency case other than follow the guidelines. We don't go off the guidelines, and everybody knows what it takes, how you get terminated, how many chances you get. I will say this, and this kind of follows with what J Judge Ashby was saying about complacency. and and. Um, is a nice segue into the question about why the defense attorney isn't there. Um, one of our, we, we, we go to these conferences and we usually take our team and one of our, we have a stakeholder group and we meet quarterly and we have a parent's lawyer and a child's lawyer and uh, the attorney general and lots of other people on the, on the big group. And we've always taken the lawyers with us, which uh, parenthetically is a really good way to keep your stakeholders engaged, is to give them some of the perks of, of being involved in this very, very difficult work. Um, get them to training, um, you know, underwrite training, bring training to you, and so forth. So they go to the conference. Well, we sent someone this year to the Nashville conference who had gotten 
the most clients into drug court and had the most graduations in whatever the time period was, fiscal year. She went to one of the sessions, the criminal drug court sessions, and now the standards are different. We're civil, it's voluntary, they sign a contract to come in. I mean, it's very, very different from criminal. However, always the ultimate result in a dependency case can be termination of um, parental rights. And so it's sort of quasi-criminal, I guess. Anyway, she went to this session and learned that you know lawyers are present in um, criminal drug court. They're there, and they're watching out for um, every time someone is going to be terminated from a criminal drug court. And I know we dealt with the same issues when I managed criminal drug court. Um, but she said, well, now I think maybe we need to be present when you're making decisions about terminating someone from drug court. Nothing has happened with that, um, and it may be that that's something the next judge is going to have to deal with. Interestingly, she was a parent's attorney. She may decide that when, before they make a <clears throat> decision to terminate, they will allow the lawyer to come in and, and make a case. We really do have very, very firm guidelines for what leads to termination, you know, so many noncompliances and, and so forth and so on over the years. Um, the information about termination is on the worksheet. They get CPS and the lawyers get the worksheet within two days of drug court. Um, so everybody knows about uh, when a client is terminated. It, it's it's um, not something that CPS has to seek out. Great. Um, okay, let's, because uh, I think that's a good segue into our, our last discussion topic here of the, uh, there we go of the webinar, which is what are some of the collaborative issues that you have encountered in implementing each of your models? And um, as you think about those, I'd like uh, maybe to think about uh, collaborative issues. What we're meaning by that is the mutual accountability among systems, convening stakeholders together, um, staying focused on treatment, um, case planning with uh, child welfare and the other agencies that you have to bring together, of course, um, and all those resource issues. Um, I think I'll start with Judge uh, Adam on this one. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the collaborative issues, strengths, and challenges you've, you've faced? Yes, and I, uh, it's really quite interesting. I mentioned a couple of them just now, but um, that we just finally had CPS be willing to join us at our uh, staffings every Wednesday. I mean, it's a huge commitment. They're way over overextended right now. They have a 100% turnover, and you know we're in a disaster, a lot of child deaths and so forth. Uh, but at any rate, really important to have them there. Also really important, we got behavioral health to come to the table, not just the uh, various treatment providers, um, but also the actual managing agency representative. And that was the, uh, maybe the best thing that ever happened to our collaborative effort because that person was letting us know about particular pools of money, SAPT money, and other little pockets where people who were chronically mentally ill or seriously mentally ill could get money even if they weren't eligible for state benefits, et cetera. But it's been, it, you know, everybody's busy, personnel change. We have a stakeholder group, as I mentioned. We're meeting quarterly. Uh, in the beginning, you know, when it was new and it was exciting, we would have everybody there. There'd be 40 people at the table. And by the time we finished the, the last meeting that we had, which was a regular meeting, um, probably um, uh, 10 months ago or so, it was the drug court team and one other person. So. I, I switched it to lunch, we brought in lunch, we um, switched it another time to coordinate with a big celebration of a drug court event. <clears throat> we had a hard time keeping people coming, and I think that's one of the things that Judge Ashby talked about with the complacency, too, is that once you're set, people think, well, it's set, and what can you need me for? We've done everything we're supposed to do. We excuse me, had a meaningful agenda, we didn't waste people's time, but we really wanted, again, to stay faithful to the guiding principles of the program, which was, for example, we used to have a jail consequence. Um, I didn't use it once in my entire time, but it remained in there. Everybody agreed on it because it was a contract, the clients agreed to it, um, but I never was imposing it. 
And we had to take, I wanted to take it out of the contract. And we needed to have everyone's agreement on that because actually there were a lot of caseworkers who said, nope, you should be sending them to jail. You know, they didn't have that option for a client that was um, totally messing up. So I think that, you know, maybe we, we need to reinstitute it, obviously. There's a new judge. Maybe people will want to come. But it is really important to have them at the table and have people be accountable um, and to find out what, how they're willing to help you and um, how they can help you serve your clients. So I'd say it's a challenge. Uh, Judge Ashby? Um, I, I suppose when I'm looking at collaborative issues, there, there are a number of positives and then there are challenges uh, that we've faced. And certainly the resource issues, um, resources, excuse me, and being able to increase um, access to the resources has been a positive and we've learned how to do that very effectively over time. But um, there then are those challenges that come up in terms of uh, partners for the Family Treatment Court, for instance, with us, our probation department, adult probation department, lost a significant number of staff during this past year and as a result, they have had to cap um, the number of cases that their designated probation officers um, can take. And so that impacts our family drug court population. And we're now having to look at um, what makes sense in terms of expanding to others so that we can provide greater access to services to additional family without using um, probation resources as heavily. Um, there obviously are those changes in administration or the personnel who are assigned to the program that often drive um, a need for us to modify the program. I think that's a good thing. Um, while it becomes a challenge, I think it also presents an opportunity because it requires us to really take a look at what we're doing and that we've been doing something the same way for the last five, ten years. It may be worthwhile to take a look at whether it still makes sense to do that. And um, I think educating not only the part system partners on a regular basis programmatically as well as on a broader issue is important, um, but also the, the larger court and child welfare related community is important. I think we tend to do a good job educating those of us on the team, but then oftentimes we forget um, how we need to send that out to the larger um, systems, um, all of the Ar Respondent Parents Council, all of the guardian ad litems, to all of the child welfare workers, those kinds of things. And so you tend, I think, over time, again, this complacency and, and you get very comfortable that um, maybe you start having fewer meetings and, and feeling as though you don't need to, as Judge Adams said, because you've kind of got it down at this point. But I think it's really important for a family treatment court team to be constantly reassessing um, what they need to do. One thing I wanted to mention, too, is just with collaborative issues, I think an important piece of this is the whole trust factor. Um, and Judge Adam referenced this in a couple of different areas. But uh, there are oftentimes things that you can't do when you first start your court or when you're in its infancy or even as you um, move into toddler or adolescence, um, that as the court matures and as time goes on, uh, you can start making changes because there is that trust that maybe wasn't there um, in the past. And so that's something that I think is important in your collaborative efforts to continue to reassess. And one last thing I would say, um, which I don't know if it directly relates to what we're talking about here, but it's just I've been reminded of it on several um, several times when we've been talking today, is I, I, I think what we have to also guard against um, when we're handling these dockets is because of the relationships all of us develop, positive or negative, um, with our clients who come into these programs, oftentimes we do get very invested in their success or their lack of success. Um, and we, we really have to be careful about whether we're setting higher expectations 
for those clients who are coming into the treatment court um, than we would otherwise. And I bring that up in the context of the collaborative issues here because um, I've noticed at, at different times the treat treatment perspective tends to be uh, very advocacy-based um, and um, as opposed to the accountability aspect of child welfare and probation and, and perhaps the court as well. And I think it's important to really look at how, how we're holding people accountable and are we holding the, them accountable appropriately and, and looking to our various partners to weigh in on that. Um, before we leave uh, this discussion, there, another question that came in, and I'll let each of you kind of briefly respond to this. But from your perspective, uh, given your uh, individual model, what do you see as the pros and cons for the Child Protective Service Agency or the Child Welfare Agency um, in your jurisdiction? Um, Judge Ashby, would you like to start with that first? Sure. Um, I think some of the pros are it that I, I've gotten feedback from the social workers that they actually really appreciate having that closer relationship with the probation officer in these cases because um, they are able to jointly case manage and many of the issues that the child welfare worker may have felt that they were out on a limb and trying to figure out how to address, they can partner with probation to work with the client to get a better result. And oftentimes the probation officer um, in our model uh, is, looks like more of the bad guy, and they're not, but sometimes because of that accountability piece on their end in the criminal case, that gives the child welfare worker um, the ability to um, actually have a little more flexibility. And also financially, I think it's helped the child welfare uh, workers significantly and the department as a whole because uh, we have been able to go after grant funding very successfully to supplement the services that they otherwise were trying to fund and sometimes didn't even have the ability to access. Uh, same with probation because of the offender services dollars that are available on the probation side. We've been able to really use those resources to support and supplement what people have been trying to do on the child welfare side alone in the past, and that's been a big benefit to them. Great. Judge Adam? I uh, think that the couple of the things that Judge Ashby mentioned would also apply here, but I'm thinking about the, the overall um, philosophy of case management and social work and uh, wanting to empower people to make change, um, strength-based practice, uh, recognizing needs and unmet needs and um, being frustrated with the inability to provide the level of service and attention that they might want to. So my experience has been with the case managers um, who've had clients in drug court and then also with case managers that I have worked with um, for years and years and years and years is that they very much appreciate the, the model of drug court um, and it's a fabulous tool for them. And we have a, we, we track who, we do a survey for everyone who is um, uh, in drug court. And I'll, I'll just add quickly that it's so integrated into the system even though it's parallel that Observing family drug court, we can't make people join because it's completely voluntary, but observing is actually in the case plan template. And every single case where there's um, an allegation around substance abuse, those parents are required to at least observe family drug court. I think that gives the, the case workers um, a lot of um, um, support for helping parents recognize a substance abuse issue and then pursue it in a really significant way. And uh, most people, many, 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 many people who observe actually end up joining us. We look at who has sent them and the vast majority are actually referred by CPS. So that tells me that they are um, very appreciative of the program. They, it also, um, we do all this extra training and we spend a lot of time 
as Judge Ashby described, going around and making sure that the rest of the system knows and remembers us. There's so much turnover in the system in general that you really have to keep doing it. You know, we do it and then we say, well, we did it last year and then we have to do it again. But I honestly believe, you know, sort of as one of the core values of social work that we fit within that model and um, requiring people to be accountable while at the same time helping them build on strengths. So as we saw earlier in the, in the presentation when we did a poll, uh, we see that many, many courts are wondering uh, or thinking about transitioning from one model to another. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, we're working directly with about five sites currently who are considering transitioning from one model to another. Um, Judge Adam, we'll start with you on this. If, uh, what advice might you have for a court who is thinking about transitioning from one model to another? What are the key factors that you might want them to consider or think about? First of all, you have to talk to everybody involved. And if you're going from um, parallel, integrated to parallel, you would really need to make sure that the people who are used to being in the room um, are comfortable not being in the room anymore. And Judge Ashby talked about the whole trust issue. And I, <clears throat> that would be an issue that you would have to um, overcome, I'm sure, people who are used to playing a big role. And vice versa, if you're going from parallel to integrated, you would really need to have a buy-in. I think that the ethical issues are significant. And I think that um, people would need to be willing to um, come to court. It's a, I think it's a time management issue. It sure would be for us. Um, and you would need to be able to convince your stakeholders, your the, not just your stakeholders, but the people who are actually responsible for the case, the caseworker, the whoever is representing the department, the parent's lawyers, the child's lawyer, um, that they are now going to need to add on probably some extra hearings. And if you're not adding on some extra hearings, what is your procedure for um, letting them know what happened? We are not on the record in, in the parallel drug court. Um, we have a minute entry, but we're not on the record. I don't have a court reporter in there. Um, and there's no transcript. So um, um, you would need to develop a mechanism for that. Um, so I would say collaboration. You have got to be, if you haven't had your stakeholders with you before, you certainly need them anytime you're making any kind of a significant change. I think it's a real mistake to try to think you can go it alone. Uh, Judge Ashby, your thoughts on uh, questions that, or considerations one might have if they're thinking about transitioning to a different model? I, I would be um, wanting to know first, is there a particular partner on the team who is um, pushing the change forward? Um, what is the process by which the decision has ultimately been made why you're changing models? And then really assess before you go through all that effort, are the reasons are, are whatever the issues or concerns that we're having with our current model going to be resolved by moving to a different model? Or is it not a model issue at all? Instead, it may relate to collaborative issues or ethical concerns or other things which you could address within the context of the model of you, that you have without thinking that moving to a different model is going to resolve it. Assuming, and, and I'm assuming everybody is uh, um, has gone through that process. Um, I agree with Judge Adam that having folks on board is really going to be important and not just, again, those on the individual um, drug tr treatment court team, but you're going to have to touch base with the larger um, systems who interact with these cases and will interact with the court because just having the buy-in of the drug court team as to what's going to work obviously is not going to do you much good if you have resistance from a larger group of child welfare workers or guardian ad litems or respondent parents counsel. So I think having, having that in place is going to be important. And if you are moving from a parallel model to the integrated model, I think there are those additional 
ethical issues that, again, can be managed, but it's going to require you to have some very clear and concrete processes in place by which you're going to address various issues, um, especially in light of what may be some uh, angst on the part of especially Respondent Parents Council um, and how their, what their role will be. Excellent. Thank you very much. So before um, we wrap up here, I would like for um, for you to offer you some, an opportunity for some closing comments. And, and uh, Judge Ashby, I'll start with you. Um, and thinking about your closing comments, maybe also you can uh, respond to this with, with the extreme uh, financial crisis that we are in, and, and so many states and localities are really struggling with their budgets. Um, I mean, uh, is, is this really worth, worth it? And, and how do you feel that, um, given your model and your jurisdiction, that really you are um, working to achieve your goals and um, it can, you can justify the resources that you're putting towards it? Sure. Well, first of all, the resources that we're putting towards it um, are, are fairly limited compared to the resources that we would be using in any event. For instance, as I said before, we don't, we're not paying for additional judicial staff or probation staff or child welfare staff or others. We already have these cases that we're dealing with. It's more just implementing a case management model within our court by which we're hoping to achieve better outcomes. Um, there are certainly some resource issues that arise, but when I look at um, ultimately the outcomes that I think we achieve um, and through evaluations we've been able to show we achieve with this, this high need, high risk population, um, the amount of resources that we're actually putting in compared to what we achieve um, it certainly makes it worth it. I think that um, on the child welfare side, uh, we've seen benefits just because in terms of the change in case management and the change also that frankly implementing the family drug court has driven cr across our court in terms of perspectives and terms of, of how all partners um, now view effective ways to address substance abuse issues in drug court cases and non-drug non court cases that that really has an overall um, benefit. We've seen that we have actually had a significant reduction in out-of-home placement, and I, I, I know and believe that both um, the, the changes in case management and changes in perspective and how we are handling these cases has had a, a significant impact on that. So I would bottom line say it's it's clearly worth the resources that we're putting in, and uh, the the costs are far outweighed by the benefits, both financial and otherwise. Judge Adams, some closing thoughts on that? Yeah, I am a big fan of therapeutic jurisprudence. You know, when you say therapeutic jurisprudence, most judges roll their eyes. And so then it became um, problem-solving courts, and then a lot of judges were still rolling their eyes. And so now we talk of it as specialty courts. So whatever you call it, the principle of really designing the way you deliver justice to the individual needs of the people who are before you is very powerful. And across the board, no matter what uh, forum, is incredibly effective. And you just need to look at the National Drug Court site, uh, National Association of Drug Court Professionals or um, NCDI, all those folks who've done the research to show how they have all the numbers on how many dollars it saves and so forth. And I think more important than that um, is that the, the view in juvenile court has always been that the focus is on the child, the focus is on the family. And it's um, really important to remember, no matter what we do, that I think if you can save one child, if you can break the cycle, if you can not be ready to open up a file for this child's children, you know, knowing that there's no hope, 
then you've done exactly what you should be doing at that moment in time. So I get, and sometimes I have a hard time justifying, well, you've only had 300 graduates in eight years, or you're only serving 50 people at a time. You know, if you're serving 50 families and, you know, 150 kids, and those kids are going to have kids, and you're talking about intergenerational substance abuse, which we're all dealing with, and intergenerational child abuse, then you're doing an extraordinary job. And it's why every single one of us comes to work every single day. So, I'm, you know, we've managed to convince our county manager that this program works. And he never batted an eye when we told him, you know, gave him the numbers. It's a small number. But as, as we get better at it, as we spread the word, what we're seeing is every judge down here now has the recovery plan that we use in drug court available to them on the bench. They hand it out in substance abuse cases. Every caseworker, or most of the caseworkers, now know how to access treatment dollars uh, for a client that's fallen off of state aid. Um, you know, the parents' lawyers know how to ask for their clients to go to the, the new uh, support group that we have uh, started with one of our stakeholders for parents who are or have been engaged in Child Protective Services. So I think if we just keep our eye on each child, each parent, and remember that that's why we're doing this work, then um, the fact that it's a small number, or that it's expensive, those concerns really kind of disappear. Thank you so much for that, Judge Adam and uh, Judge Ashby, uh, for your remarks and for the lively discussion today. We really appreciate that. We appreciate everyone who participated on today's webinar. Um, we hope that it gives you some ideas or thoughts to uh, go forward and thinking about the structure or the model that you're using, and, and hopefully you see it as it, it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all. Um, it really is about achieving your goals that you set out for in your particular community, in your jurisdiction. And so um, thinking through some, some resources that might help um, uh, those uh, to help you think about, are you achieving your goals? Um, you know, hopefully many of you are participating in, in a local evaluation that's helping you to think about or to see if you're achieving your goals and measuring those goals. Um, another resource we might offer here for you is uh, you can perform an operational tune-up on your family drug court. Uh, this was a presentation that uh, was hosted recently, recently at the National Family Drug Court Symposium. You can see the link here and, and take a look at that. Um, uh, that, that their presentation that they provided, um, I think it offers some, some great insight and uh, great opportunities for you to use in your own jurisdiction. Uh, there's an article here, it's written by Judge Nikki Pock, an overview of operational family dependency treatment courts. You can download it on this link that you see on the bottom of your screen. And, and of course, uh, you can contact us um, and we'd be happy to connect you uh, with a consultant or to process uh, your own family drug court and to look at are you meeting your goals and, and, and looking at your structure and, and, and if the model is somehow getting in the way, uh, maybe we can have a discussion about that. Um, we recognize we weren't able to get to all of your questions today and, and many of them were very good. Um, and so we want to keep this conversation going and, and so please visit our blog. Uh, the questions we weren't able to get to today, we'll work to uh, post those on the blog uh, with the responses and so please visit our blog um, and uh, let's keep this conversation going. We uh, hope that you'll join us for next month's webinar on sustainability. Uh, you can go ahead and register now using this link that's below. Um, is your family drug court really built to last? The importance of real sustainability planning. So we hope to see you there next month um, on November 14th. Uh, we'll start that one a little earlier next month at uh, 10 o'clock Pacific. So um, thank you again for, for joining us, and we hope that you will complete the evaluation. We, we take your comments and feedback very seriously, and we hope to improve on these each time we do them. Next, next month will be our last webinar for 2012, and we will be uh, soon getting out information on what our uh, 2013 webinar series will look like. So. Again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And thanks for all the work that you're doing out there in the field for children and families. Uh, thanks again to Judge Adam and Judge Ashby and to the staff here at CFF for putting together this webinar.
been a pleasure. Thank you very much.